Tilo, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. We are not live, but you can leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on the post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. Uh, what's this behind me? That's if we go live and you miss anything. That's where all the good stuff will be. Uh, don't forget we are. We do got the Patreon link down in the description. Um, this is if you want to support in any other type of way. This pays the bills. This what makes it all possible. Uh, and don't forget we do got the Discord. Send your request here. This is I never even heard about this honestly until like last week um that shows you how self-absorbed america is because i had no idea maybe or maybe it's because i just don't watch the news i don't even i mean this is in 2005 how old was i i was young i was in yeah there's no way i would okay but it's an important part of y'all history and i'm here with y'all 100 percent so this is 7-7 seven, seven London bombing, 10 years on. Well, more than 10 now. Let's get into it. We were innocent, July but the 7. aim was to destroy us. I've never lost the gratitude that I survived. How do I find meaning in that? How do I find a, a meaning to something that's so senseless? to innocent good things come to those who the commercial right off the bat is tough I did hear about this, now that I'm thinking about it. I'm tweaking, that's what I did. It's still crazy. Obviously, it's crazy. It was a beautiful, typical London summer. So we all had our coats on. Um, it had been very hot and it was just this very light misting of rain. The night before I played cricket um, for the company, so it was, it was a nice sort of summer period. Morning rush hour. London was still celebrating its successful bid for the 2012 Olympics the day before. I just sat down at the very front, so the very first seat in the carriage and was engrossed in the newspaper because uh, obviously there had been the news of the, uh, the Olympics. I was just so excited. It was just fantastic and it was going to be the beginning of another chapter. Set the stage. Now I feel like I'm emotionally like, you know what I'm saying? Because y'all had a good moment the day before Y'all had just found out some good news. Okay. Lawyer Thelma Stober had worked for three years on the Olympic campaign. She was on the circle line, running later than usual because she'd taken her seven-year-old son, Lewis, to school. I had a quick chat with the teacher and I kept saying, we won, we won, we won. <laughs> and then I left and uh, went to the tube station and um, went to get the train to work. 24-year-old Carrie Taylor was in the same carriage, having said goodbye to her mother at Liverpool Street. 
We used to leave here together and would get the train up to Liverpool Street. She'd then get on the onto the, uh, the the tube network, and I would just walk walk to work. And we always had the obligatory. She used to peck me on the cheek, and I used to slap her on the backside. It was just silly stuff. It was sheer chance that brought so many people that morning to a time and a place that would change their lives in an instant. Richard Levy had taken a different route to see progress on Arsenal's new Emirates Stadium. I was a bit of a football fan, and I used to like going past this stadium, and every week I'd go past it, it was slightly more bill, slightly more bill, slightly more bill. Jill Hicks had forgotten her travel card and had to queue for a ticket. I was running late, and I never, ever ran late for work. This was the only morning that I did that. Tim Coulson happened to be in London for a course on a circle line train going through Edgware Road. It wasn't a regular... Yeah, so everybody in this documentary was just there by chance. Commute at all. Uh, London was a place I, I didn't go to very much. I went there for the art. I was also slightly thrown by the fact that the uh, stations were absolutely rammed with people still at half past eight in the morning. When it comes to transportation, me at least, like public transportation, um, I haven't had to take it in years until I moved to Miami. Um, but like, I'm like a creature of habit. Like, I don't like to be late. I like to see the same driver every day. I like to be on the same bus every day. If something's out of place, I will notice it. And I will stare it down. <laughs> like, you get what I'm saying? Like, you know. On the same line as Tim heading the other way, 22-year-old David Folks was on his first solo trip. Maybe it's because it's like, from being from Chicago and, and things of that nature. Like, there'd be a lot of funny stuff going on on public transportation, so you gotta be, like, very vigilant. So I, I, guess, that, I guess that could play a part in why I'm like that. From Manchester to London. He'd never traveled on the tube. And I remember we uh, looked up the, the tube, printed off a tube map, and described where he would go and which tube we would get on and where he would get off and so on. Um, and he was on something like a six o'clock, six a.m. train from Manchester, which meant he left home at about five a.m. So he got up at about four a.m. Why should you use mirror when you draw on a whiteboard? It is what it is. Huh? On the Piccadilly line, Jill Hicks and Richard Levy each battled to get onto the same overcrowded train at King's Cross. The platform was packed full of people, almost, I'd say, six people deep. People on the underground don't talk to each other. It's this unwritten rule if you don't talk to anyone on the underground. And we're all sitting there, standing there rather, waiting for this train to come. In. Little did I know, at the same time, boarding as me, was the suicide bomber. It's nothing more than just... I don't have to say, like, if a train is packed like that, I don't even get on that joint. Me, this is me, though. Like, I'm just, I'm just comparing what happened to them to me. Like, if I see a train that's overly packed, I'm waiting on the next one because I don't like to touch nobody. Like, I don't like to be like, I'm a big dude. I'm wide. Like, I'm 6'2", 250 plus pounds. Like, I'm not trying to be all next to nobody like that. Just, um, random. I'm going to just listen. I ain't going to pause no more. Moments in your life that you decide to move slightly to the right or slightly ahead or slightly to the left that change. What happened to you that day? Yeah. Three separate trains radiating out from King's Cross, carrying thousands of commuters on that Thursday morning in July. All connected within moments around 8.47. There was probably no more than 20 seconds into the journey. It was, it was, um, it was nothing, really. Um, and I didn't hear anything. Um, I think the sound was so overpowering that it just... Um, the first thing, in fact, I remember was that it was a yellow light that, that flashed. Not even a click, no noise, no anything. The whole of my world went completely black. And I thought, in that moment, 
I've just died. I must have had a heart attack and I've, this is death. CCTV from Oldgate Station shows the moment the bomb went off. I felt as if I was um, lifted up and I... CCTV from... So the train leaves at 7.45 from Oldgate Station. 50, 50 seconds. Station shows the moment. And one minute later, 7.45. moment the bomb went That's off. I felt as if I was um, lifted up and I was circling round and I could um, see a very bright light and I could hear from a distance lots of screams. Colin Pettit was on the same carriage further away from the bomb. There was a, a great deal of smoke and I was very concerned that I'd actually survived whatever had taken place which I thought at that stage was a, a train crash but uh, I was very worried about potentially burning alive uh, in the carriage itself. But as he made his way through the debris, he realized this was no train crash. I remember there was a, a sort of a young lady, blonde hair. Uh, she was sort of bent over backwards across the lap of a, uh, another passenger who was just sitting there motionless. And her clothes, she was in her underwear. So again, obviously due to the explosion, that's the point when I realized it had been an explosion because uh, her, cl her sort of outer clothes, clothes apart from her underwear had been blowing off her. That young girl was Carrie Taylor. She was cared for by another commuter who'd come to her aid from the next carriage. He could hear people shouting, and he, and he thought, you know, he can't do I, just do keep I walking. go? He couldn't. He just couldn't do it. He had to go. He had go to come ahead. back. He told me, and, and he he got in the carriage with Carrie, yeah. and he comforted Carrie for quite some time. Before help could reach them from the outside world, the survivors were left depending on one another. Colin jumped down onto the track and followed screams he could hear from people who'd been blown out of the train, including Thelma. Oh, blown out of the train? Out, okay. Like, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know what I'm saying? So I know, like, but I know it made it even that much worse because it was in, like, an enclosed space underground with pr pressure and air ratio is not even the right, you know what I'm saying? I opened my eyes and I saw that I was actually lying on the train track and um, by the train. Part of part of my body was um, underneath the, the, the train. She told me her name was Thelma. She was a, uh, a lawyer. She had a son. Um, and I, sort of, I was assessing, you know, looking at her legs. There was a lot of a, uh, deep lacerations in her legs. Her, her left foot was twisted around, pretty much pointing the wrong way. Part of the door was actually stuck to my thigh. And the, the door of the train had come off and part of it was hanging. And there were people screaming and shouting on the train. And um, And I could see legs hanging out of the window of the train. When the bomb went... Today, boy. See, that's why I don't like watching stuff like this, man. I know this is a hard watch for people, but I don't know. I never knew. Somebody suggested it to me, but like I like I'm into the race of humankind, you know what I'm saying? So anything that like or innocent people as a whole are like I, it's weird, you know what I'm saying? Because I've done things, but it's like like this stuff like this is gonna get under my skin every time. It's going to make me emotional. So if you see me hit this BRB button like this, you know why I got to get myself together out here because this is one of the ones that I feel it already. Went off on the Circle Line train near Edgware Road. The force of the explosion stopped Tim Coulson's train passing in the other direction. The sound of people screaming in the bombed train drove Tim and two other men to risk their own lives to help. Real men. 
the three of us had a very similar drive to help our fellow man in some way. And uh, we searched around and we found a metal pole, which is used for scraping ice in the exposed parts of the underground. And we smashed the window. And uh, as um, one of the others held onto that pole, I climbed through that broken window. And I came across um, uh, a man, uh, no clothes on the top half of his body, and his lower half of his body was uh, below the train floor. He was in a hole, st sitting up, facing me, um, and alive. Tim crawled under the train to try to free the man, but he was beyond help. I knew I was going to have to do something uh, and be with him at the end of his life. And I knew it was, somehow I knew that was important, not because I knew the man, but I didn't know if he was married, whether he had children, but to me, no one, no one should die alone, ever. We know they do, but... Honestly, you wouldn't even have that type of quote if you ain't been through nothing like that, but that's deep. That's deep. He's right. No one should die alone. I could prevent that one. Plain and simple. Your business can't scale on QuickBooks. My daughter called for me. I know y'all hear her. Those struggling to survive underground had no idea that others were going through the same experience on two other tube trains. The only clarity they had in the chaos was that their carriage had been hit by a massive explosion. You look around, you think, oh, there are no windows. Oh, there's no doors, there's, there's no roof. This carriage is now a shell, effectively, we're in a tunnel, because soot is pouring down. Breaking news we're getting from the PA Newswire that there's been reports of an explosion outside Liverpool Street Station. Eyewitnesses say there was a bang heard during rush hour. Details still very sketchy. Above ground, the picture was changing with every passing moment. The latest we're hearing is that several London underground stations have been evacuated. British Transport Police just telling us that there are walking wounded. It was an explosion and it happened at Aldgate Tube Station. Aldgate East, I beg your pardon. The first reports blamed power surges and possible train collisions. Clearly no, no one seems, or no one here seems to be entirely sure what has gone on yet. It, it, it really it really is a scene of some confusion here. A witness report saying people are streaming out of Oldgate tube station covered in blood. In the deepest tunnel between King's Cross and Russell Square, some victims were only just regaining consciousness. As the doors gave way, uh, there's electric cables that run alongside the, the tunnel, and I got thrown very heavily against those cables, um, and that produced effectively what felt like a bolt of lightning going through me. I have no idea how long it was for that blackness to be lifted, but it was only when I heard other people scream. Oh, my jaw was just locked. My God, I got my neck hurting. Like, I haven't watched nothing like this in maybe, I don't know, it's been a minute. And I can see why people go and fight for their country. Like, this shit, stuff like this, Screaming, I, that I felt I very mean, comforted I by that and, and thought, okay, I'm not alone. There was a big hole in the carriage and there was people lying everywhere, covered in blood and screaming help. So I don't know what exploded, but something exploded. We're all talking to each other. We're all saying, yep, still here. Yep, still alive, still okay. I still had a scarf on. I took my scarf off ripped that in two and tied tourniquets up the tops of my legs. And as I was tying the tourniquet up the top of my right leg, my hand went right into my thigh. And I thought, okay, this is, this is really bad, but don't panic.
My bad, I'm gonna edit that out. Just couldn't find her pacifier, you know how that go. Panic. Okay, this is this is really bad. But don't panic because everything always looks worse than what it really is. Despite his injuries, Richard Levy made it to the driver's cab. The driver told him to head for Russell Square tube station, but warned him that the line could still be live. All you're waiting for is the metaphorical light at the end of the tunnel. That, that's really what you're, you're looking at. Um, and I saw a guy running in the other direction, he had a luminous jacket in, and he said, are you okay? And um, in a way, they're the three greatest words I could have heard because you're talking to someone who is just saying, you're okay, you're okay. And I said, I don't know if I'm okay, but I do know that people need help in there. They're telling us some casualties in what they're describing as a major incident on London Underground. Other than, I don't know what happened. You probably know more than me. I was in the front carriage and people were severely injured there. Um, but I've heard, and I don't know if it's right, that people were even worse further back. Do you know why I'd rather become an online closer and make one to four... The chaos was spreading. As the capital was sealed off, people around the country were switching on the news reports. Anybody who had someone they loved in London became increasingly worried. I was watching the news constantly. I tried to ring Harry God knows how many times, and as Judith said, all the mobiles, the system had gone down. I remember thinking, no, this can't be, because we live 200 miles away, it's his first trip to London, but the poor lad must be stressed out, he's caught up in it somewhere, he's probably really anxious, doesn't know what to do. Underground, all the survivors could do was wait and help one another. At Edgware Road, Tim Coulson had moved on to comfort a young woman with serious injuries. We were on our own, um, and I'd faced her deliberately away from the carnage um, because I'd seen more than enough for the rest of my life, and I didn't believe she needed to see any of it. She had been, as I say, knocked unconscious. I was aware that she'd also got a very badly damaged uh, left leg, and her left... I was getting larger. It had, uh, I now know it had shrapnel in it, but at the time it was just swelling out of all proportion. It seemed like forever. When you've got, you know, when you're surrounded by people who've been, who've been killed or when there's people that are sort of very badly injured, that's about what you want is people there to assist you. I, I, I could do nothing. I was determined not to die, and, and Colin said, you know, I, I was a fighter. I was really determined because I felt uh, my job is not done yet. There are lots of things I wanted to do, and, um, you know, um, I wasn't ready to go. Yeah, I feel you. At this point, like, it's crazy. Like, I, I got to put myself in y'all's shoes, but, like, at this point, you got to be, like, like she said, like, your will to survive through something like this has got to be crazy. You got to be, it's got to be up there. <laughs> The first person to arrive was a young um, paramedic uh, dressed in green and yellow called Lisa and she broke down into tears and knelt on the floor and I said, Lisa, you've got a bag, what's in it? Can we have a look or something of that nature? Because uh, she said, we've got nothing. And that just was enough to jog her back into a... This dude right here, he's driving the greatest... He was one of them ones in there. He was making stuff happen. State of reality to say, I see I'm here to do a job. It was the explosion of a bus at Tavistock Square almost an hour after the first bombs that confirmed that this was no power outage, but a full-scale attack on London. I was one... Wait, a bus? They did a bus too? ...of those that had to be evacuated walking towards... Russell Square and suddenly a huge explosion uh, on the street up in front of me and all I could see was the top of a bus completely destroyed. George Saradakis was the driver of the number 30 bus. 
full of passengers evacuated from the tube network. Every scene I looked and see and saw a massacred uh, bodies, I kept saying, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. And uh, at some point, uh, I raised my hands and say very angrily, they killed all my passengers. One brave man walked in and uh, see me shaking, says to me, George, don't worry, don't worry. And I was crying and he was trying to comfort me, to calm me down. I might actually edit this. One of the few pieces of good fortune that day was that the bus exploded outside the headquarters of the British Medical Association, where senior doctors were meeting, including emergency response leader Peter Holden. Yeah, that's good. I mean, as good as it's going to get, but with all that tragedy that's happened, that is good. Everybody just came outside and got straight to it. I looked out into the courtyard and you could see people being brought in on tabletops, being used as stretchers. some of the curtains out of the staterooms, we cut those up into bandages uh, because this is an office building, it's not a hospital. Right. Within minutes, Peter was directing 16 doctors as they treated the casualties in the courtyard. There are two locations at the front of, in the outer courtyard of BMA House, uh, where I invoked Category 4, which is, or otherwise known as Priority 1 Expectant. It's where you have a patient who is so seriously injured, they have absolutely no prospect of survival. Usually, they, and thankfully, they were deeply unconscious. You put a human being with them. So they're not alone when they die. It's only been done once in civilian practice. It is possible that uh, if the explosion on the tube train uh, in King's Cross happened on that Piccadilly line, say halfway between Russell Square and King's Cross, they might be approaching it from both ends. Round the corner from the bus explosion at Russell Square tube station, the chaos was delaying ambulances from reaching the injured. But in this tight-knit city, staff from two nearby hospitals came running to help the paramedics. We were very, very lucky because um, a, a lot of doctors and nurses turned up at Russell Square. I remember, I remember saying to um, two police officers who were guarding the entrance for me and saying to them, um, if, if people come with identification as a doctor and nurse, I, I, I need their help. There were people lying everywhere. Um, you know, they were propped up against yes. the ticket barriers, they were propped up against signs, against the walls, and all you could smell was smoke and blood. And we didn't see anybody who had minor injuries. We saw people that had arms. Wait a minute, she said all you can smell was smoke and blood? You know how much blood there has to be for there to be a smell illuminating throughout the neighborhood? That's crazy. It really puts it in perspective how big this was. Arms From missing. Me. We saw people that had legs missing. Richard Levy finally managed to reach the surface. A lady came over and she said, you have to lie down. You're losing a lot of blood, you're in a bad way. You have to lie down. And I think at that point, the adrenaline that had really kept me going from the moment of impact until this point, pretty much um, what wrong with him? wore off. I remember Richard just looking up at me and just covered in soot and I was sitting kind of almost at his head level and um, with his head between my knees with the oxygen mask on and just talking to him and I just remember him looking up at me terrified. Carrie stayed with me um, for a long time. She was, she was, um, she was fantastic and she said, um, 
don't look to your right. Um, because there's a really... I think it's Jill. Jill Hicks was the last person to be brought up alive from that tunnel that day. I could feel a touch on my shoulder. That, from the tunnel that day. And the words, priority one, and I just felt immediate release. Thank God you're here. I'll give myself to you now. I've done all I can. Here I am. She was barely alive. And I remember thinking, I, I just, no one's going to die here today. Well, we will move heaven and earth to keep everyone alive. We'll do what we possibly can. There's at least three or four people around her, and they were resuscitating her at that point um, with cardiac massage. So, you know, they were doing the breathing for her and pumping her heart for her. And the first thing I realised was that she had no legs below the knee. Both of them um, were completely blown away. Oh, yeah, because she said she could feel the inside of her legs. By the time the most seriously injured were being brought up to the surface, it was becoming clear that London had suffered its worst ever terrorist attack. The initial anxiety of those who hadn't heard from relatives was turning into panic. It was blanket news then, and there was an emergency casualty bureau phone number coming across the bottom. So I phoned them, and um, they, they only received information, they didn't give information out. So I just said, David Folks, gave his age and a brief description. I can remember John phoning up and saying that nobody had heard from her work. Um, and I the words, he said to me, June, I think we've lost her. And I just, I just said to him, no, don't, don't say that, don't say that. Out of the chaos of four simultaneous bombings, emergency services were starting to impose order. Our priority for all the emergency services at the moment is the rescue operation, which is at present still continuing. From what was this initial confusion um, and this horrendous thing that we're dealing with, you will get order and you will get your patients to hospital. It will, it will work out in the end for you. You've just got to believe in that and just get on with it. I was dashing in Idaho. Looking down onto Russell Square tube station at the moment, uh, there's a row of about 20 ambulances immediately outside the tube station. Also, uh, fire rescue vehicles, fire uh, fighters are down in Russell Square tube station itself. At Russell Square, Jill Hicks and Richard Levy were being stretched into ambulances. The wristband said priority two, and I sort of said, my hearing was terrible. And I... I, we still don't know what fully happened to Richard, do we? We know Jill is missing. Unfortunately, we know what happened to Jill. What's happening to Jill? Because but the blast know. had been so loud. And I said to someone, what does priority two mean? And they say, um, it's bad, but there's priority one. And, and there are people who are really badly injured who we need to focus on a little bit. It's like, OK. He still ribs me that he, he started his life in the it's carriage Jill. as a priority one, but was downgraded when they gave me the priority one. He became a priority two. So they thought he was that bad. OK, but then they reclassified him. They put me in an ambulance and they said, just tell you no, we're going to go very, very fast and it's going to be very, very bumpy, so hold on and don't take your oxygen mask off and keep talking. Again, I, I think it's a sign in my mind that I didn't quite realise how bad I was. But I thought, well, when we get to hospital, I wonder if I'm going to have to wait with everybody. And um, that wasn't the case. They just took me right through. Tim Coulson was still with the young woman he'd been comforting since jumping into the bombed carriage just before nine o'clock that morning. I held onto her hand and she said, you won't let go, will you? And I said, no, not until I'm told to. And they'll have to have a damn good reason. Row after row of ambulances turning up all the time, obviously not just the London Ambulance Service, but they're being brought in from throughout the home counties to help out. 
At Aldgate, Thelma Stober had been brought up to the surface and put into an ambulance heading to the Royal London. There was somebody sitting with me, and I think it's one of the paramedics. And I could hear him giving directions to the driver. And I said to him, how come he is an ambulance driver and he doesn't know his way to the hospital? <laughs> of course, I hadn't appreciated the significance of what had happened and the fact that they had to bring people from out of London who were not familiar with the area. Wow. For the survivors who'd been... They had ambulances from across the country come out. It's helping to keep the... It makes sense, though. This is what... You need everybody at this point. ...injured alive underground. There were mixed emotions as they handed them over to the paramedics. I don't know if my brain was, was trying to sort of eliminate the goriness of, of, of what was down there, because uh, I was still a bit dazed from the whole situation. So whether I think the focus was just on particular points, such as, you know, trying to get out, trying to help people when you come across them. I just absolutely collapsed in a heap of tears and, you know, just some of that harsh reality beginning to bite for the very first time. I mean, this other chap just uh, started to uh, walk up the tunnel and uh, it just did it all go. And it was quite funny. I remember the, the other guy, I think he was due to go to a training course and he just said, right, OK, nice to meet you. And uh, he just went off straight to his training course, as far as I'm aware. The survivors were arriving at hospital. Many had life-changing injuries. This is what we're gonna see. It don't even matter, like, but it's not, I remember what- It don't even matter what the injuries are, but... Like, Richard, he don't even know what's really happening to him, and by, like, I don't either. Like, I thought Richard was cool, he, but they categorized him as one, then downgraded him because somebody was worse. Like, that mean he bad. Why does this keep doing that? Waking up in hospital and I couldn't speak for some time. Um, and I was intubated and had various tubes on everything. But I remember very clearly trying to motion, show me my arms. I, I need to know, do I have arms? That's crazy. Putting myself in that situation again, like waking up from a coma, basically, thinking like, just show me, just please let me have arms. Like the thought that, like that being a thought in your mind, like. I woke up. That's the, um, in um, the hospital a few days later. And I was told that my left foot had been amputated and um, that I had very severe injuries. This clearly was a callous attack on purely innocent members of the public, deliberately designed to kill and injure innocent members of the public. The first official confirmation that many people had died in all four bombs came that afternoon. It was not a good place, our house at that time. So we didn't go to bed that night. We spent the whole night phoning, phoning and phoning. We went around all the hospitals that they said that they'd sent people to because we had a picture of her. And I know we couldn't go in and see the people, but we asked the nurses, have you got anybody that could be... Because they had people there that were badly burnt. And at that stage, you didn't care. You just wanted to know she was OK. Many of the victims were unidentifiable. Their clothes and... Pos I couldn't even imagine being a parent and my kid is going through the... Like, I, this is possessions blown away by the force of the bomb. Liable, their clothes and possessions blown away by the force of the bomb. For those waiting at home, it would be days before they got confirmation of what they were dreading. There was a knock at the front door and a young, young girl in plain clothes who identified herself as a police officer asked to come in. Told us that she was from Greater Manchester Police. She'd been instructed by the Metropolitan Police to come and see us, but she had no information to give us whatsoever. But she wanted to take DNA swaps. At that point, daft as it sounds, we were rearranging rooms here. Well, she could sleep downstairs. If she, if she lost her, we know she'd lose her leg. 
And we thought, that's OK, we can look after her. There's three of us, we can look after her, we'll get help. We can, she can have all what she needs in there and we've got... It's crazy to see the mindset and the thought process of what's going on when you really don't even know you're in the dark. And this is what, this is, like, you hear what she's saying? This is, this is the best that she's hoping for. These are, this is the, you know what I'm saying? It's the best possible scenario that she's hoping for right now. She ain't even thinking about the worst. He's thought about it. Look. I don't, with bungalow, so she's got a bathroom. All the things, we're planning her coming back, and then, you know, it's silly. It's silly, and then you get told she's not coming back because she's in the mortuary. Searching for a new home, Lennar has a wide variety. And then Wednesday evening at 20 past six, um, had a phone call to confirm that David had been killed. Fifty-two people were dead. But four others had deliberately set out that day to bring carnage to London. Whatever they do, it is our determination that they will never succeed in destroying what we hold dear in this country. The youngest suicide bomber, 18-year-old student Hasib Hussein, killed 13 on the Tavistock Square bus. 19-year-old carpet fitter Jermaine Lindsay killed 26 on the King's Cross Russell Square train. 22-year-old Shezad Tanweer killed seven at Aldgate. And 30-year-old teaching assistant Mohammed Sadiq Khan killed six at Edgware Road. I'd expected to see a monster, and I didn't see a monster. I saw a young man. And I looked and looked and looked at this picture in the, in the paper, and I thought, what in the hell has led you, a 19-year-old man, to detonate a bomb, to kill yourself, to do this to me, to take so many lives? The St Thomas's Hospital has this incredible view over London. And what I remember strikingly was a loss of innocence about safety. And I remember thinking, I'm safe in hospital. Hospital's okay, because I'm safe. Nothing bad can happen to me here. And used to look out across London and see this amazing view and see people going about their everyday lives and used to think, wow, do they not realize what's just happened? That's a fair thought at this point. Ten years have passed since the day that took Jill Hicks's legs. I want to say it with my body because my body is the thing that's the difference. That's what's changed in the last ten years. And the event has changed my body. Then they'll attach the safety rope that they're going to manage. Jill has set herself 10 physical challenges, one for every year since 7-7, starting with abseiling down the tallest building in Adelaide in southern Australia, where she now lives. There's been a lot of sleepless nights, and but I keep thinking, I keep transporting myself back to that carriage, and I keep thinking I faced what many of us would feel was the unfaceable. I, if I can do that, I can do any of this. Jill has spent the last decade struggling to understand what drove four young British men to murder so many of their fellow countrymen. It's the big question, isn't it? How do we stop this ever happening again? And how do we each play a role? And that's what I think is the continuous journey that is still, I'm still on 10 years later. I'm glad she's getting along. I'm glad she's getting on with her life. And she hasn't let this affect her. Like, she's done her best to not let this affect her too much. She set up a charity called Make a Difference, a network of people around the world working to defeat extremism and promote peace. I'm often confronted with that wall of hatred, of the absolute division of us and them. 
and I become a them to somebody who feels that they're part of a group called the us. And it's breaking that, that barrier, breaking through that group and saying that actually I'm living proof that we are all one, that we are one humanity. The group of seven seven bombers led by Mohammed Sadiq Khan and his extreme Islamist views had turned inwards and become so fueled by hatred that it seemed right to kill dozens of innocent people, fellow Muslims amongst them. Their path to radicalization is now very familiar 10 years on. Terror attacks by Islamist extremists have taken lives across the world and governments everywhere are wrestling with the problem. Since 2005, the number of potential young children or young people being attracted to terrorism has accelerated to the rate now where in 2015, barely a day goes by without us reading about some young person being corrupted, brainwashed, and to travel up to Syria or other parts of the world to train to be terrorists. Jill Hicks's determination is shared by others whose lives were changed by 7-7. Never again has become their pledge to those who died to do everything in their power to prevent another such atrocity. I just can't bear the thought that another family might have to experience what we've had to experience. That, that, that is too much. And so if I can do anything to stop another family having that experience, I will do it. And I will talk to whoever and say whatever is necessary to prevent any other family having to undergo. What... Like as he sits here and talks, like you can't help but like think about what if this was, what if I was in his shoes and that was my kid? Like I'd be sick. I'd definitely be, I, I wouldn't be right. I wouldn't be right. I'm not even gonna say what I'd be on, but I, w I wouldn't be right. I could, yeah, like, they, I don't know. I don't know how I would be able to cope. I don't know how I'd be able to. We did. The bereaved and the survivors continue to bear witness to what they've gone through, speaking to young people in danger of radicalization. Me being angry is not going to change what's happened to me. But if I can put my um, energy into something positive it, and make a, lot, a difference to the life of one person or two, you know, then, you know, it would have been worth it. You talk about that... We still don't know what happened in here. What's the purpose of doing something like that? What, what's the purpose of setting off a bum on the London Underground? And, and what's it achieved? I don't think it's achieved anything. It might, um, hasn't changed the world. Um, in that sense, it's changed people's world on an individual level, but on a, on a macro level. Nobody should die. Nobody should die ever again. There is no need. 7-7 achieved absolutely nothing for any cause. No laws were changed. No actions ensued that the Islamist extremists could claim were a victory. It was a completely pointless mass murder event. Now, just for the record, so we got a Moissanite chain and... Philip Beer, Anna Brandt, Kieran Cassidy, Carrie Taylor, at Edgware Road, Michael Stanley Brewster, Jonathan Downey, David Fuchs, Every anniversary, survivors, rescuers, and the bereaved gather to remember 7-7. Laura Susan Webb, Michael Matsushita. We meet up for the 7th of July, um, and it's almost as if we've, we've never been apart. You don't need to speak. Um, everybody there knows why we're there, and you feel like you're, you're best friends. You, you're there for one reason, and you don't have to discuss that reason. A decade on, the bonds remain unbroken, particularly between those who gave comfort to one another underground. Every year, every 7-7, seven, seven, I will send him an email saying, thank you, my guardian angel. I know Thelma refers to me as her guardian angel, and uh, yeah, I, I suppose, perhaps in her opinion, I am, but I, I think anyone 
else would have done the same thing in the same situation. I think he played a significant part um, to my survival. And for that, I'll be forever um, grateful. grateful. I think people feel they played a relatively small role, or some people feel they played a relatively big role, but they don't want any real acknowledgement for it. And I think what Carrie did, and many others, but Carrie in my instance, um, it's it's terrific, and it's um, it's it's a bond between you. Because how can there not be a bond between you after after those moments? To him, I was the most wonderful person alive, and that was quite strange to get that kind of feedback when you just think you're doing something ordinary. You don't really think about, you know, and it's just ordinary. It's a reaction. You know, you've got someone there who needs help. You help them, and you don't appreciate at the time how much that means to somebody. 7-7 was a day that changed lives forever. The price Tim Coulson paid for his courage in jumping into the carriage that day was years of post-traumatic stress. Over the years since July 2005, people have asked a whole range of questions and one of them is often, would you do that again? I don't know how to answer that question and I don't truly believe anybody would. I would like to think I would. I'd like to think I'd be able, enabled to do. I believe you would. Your track record shows you are that type of man. Simple as that. So, but I've absolutely no idea whether that would be fact or fiction. Let's look at the positives. I'm much taller than I used to be. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, okay. She did it, so it's okay if I laugh. I, you know, I've, I've proven to myself that I can do things I never thought of that were possible. So that's okay, but, but now I've got this new little person. <laughs> she doesn't know mum with legs. And she's just just over two now, so we're, we're getting to this really interesting time when... Hey, kids have stopped a lot of stuff and they heal a lot of pain. She just takes off, and I can't chase after her. So, and but, but we don't have enough language yet for me to reason with her to say, look, Mummy can't chase after you. <laughs> There's never a day that goes by where I don't think about it, but uh, again, I'm able to control it, I'm able to suppress it, and... You know, I've, I've, since then, I've, the, my girlfriend at the time, I've married her, had a couple of kids. So, so again, I'm sort of, you know, I'm in a happy place. So, for me, there's no need to think about, you know, these people who are politically motivated to, to potentially kill people. To me, you know, they're just, I, I don't really want to get in the time of day, really. I honestly just pray that I never have to be in a situation like this. And... I pray that no one else has to be in a situation like this, period. But, but like... The day she died, I died, if that makes sense. She meant, she meant so much, to, I say to me, but she meant the same to her dad and yeah, to her brother. It's just I wanted more. I, 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 I'm selfish like that. I didn't want just 24 years. I didn't think that was... She, I wasn't ready to give her back. You go to bed and you walk past his bedroom. When you come get up in the morning, you walk past his bedroom. When you sit down for dinner, he's not there. As a family, we always sat down together. Um, it, it was, and still is, very, very difficult. That morning, it didn't matter to any single person whether I was male or female, what colour my skin was, whether I had a faith or no faith at all, all that mattered was that I was a human being. That stayed with Hello, me for the last 10 years and will stay with me for the rest of my life. It's an absolute question that on July the 7th, 2005, you saw the worst of humanity. So no, no question about that statement. But equally, in many cases, and many in many cases of people who weren't trained, who were just ordinary people, who haven't sought publicity or fame or gratitude, you also saw the best of humanity. And that, that's people just saying, I'm gonna help. Like, I have, I have a real thing about minding my business. 
You know what I'm saying? But like, if something like this was to happen, God forbid. I like I I, I you, you know what I'm saying that that human factor take over it's like yo a lot of people are hurt like, what can I do let's let's get it done R I P to all those victims man I hope I just, I just continue to hope that nothing will happen like this ever again I mean from this moment and forward you know what I'm saying T L O leave a like comment. I'm